Uh, good morning, everyone. I, I'm honored to be here. It's, it's really uh, very exciting, and uh, thank you for letting me spend the day with you. For now, let me give you some context. Think College represents most of these type of activities. The standard space conceptual framework really is around evaluation and research, and I'm going to focus on that, those activities this morning. But I would be remiss not to mention the Higher Education Opportunities Act. You heard the panelists and Bob Stodden referenced it. It really laid the foundation for what is happening across the country regarding post-secondary education and students with intellectual disabilities. It spurred funding out of the National Institute of Disability and Rehabilitation Services. It spurred funding out of the Office of Post-Secondary Education, the model demonstrations. California's lucky that they, they were able to secure three model demonstration programs, fondly called TIPSITs, like we really needed another acronym. <laughs> TIPSIT stands for a transition, comprehensive transition program, post-secondary program for individuals, uh, students with individuals with intellectual disabilities. <laughs> uh. I'm just going to use the term tips it. <laughs> but they also funded a national coordinating center. And that center um, belongs, was awarded to Think College at UMass Boston at the Institute for Community Inclusion. This map shows where most of the tips it's are located. There is more on the East Coast than the West Coast. Why, why is that, do people think? Closer to Washington. Closer to Washington, perhaps. Uh, mass transit? Mass transit? I never thought of that one, but OK. <laughs> Creative. More money. More money. <laughs> Taxes. <laughs> there simply are more institutes of higher education on the East Coast. And we see this reflected in, in many other, if you look at um, lumber, lumber li liquidators, um, businesses, the map looks similar to this. A lot of industry, higher education plays out, it's more populated. So there, of course there'd be more opportunities because there's, there's greater demand. But what is really startling is, is the lack of activity in the center of our country. Fortunately, there were a few awardees in North Dakota, Colorado, and Texas. But really, if you take a look there, there's a great need. But anyway, this is where the TIPSID grantees are in the coordinating center. Let me just give you a little bit more of context because it was the National Coordinating Center <coughs> across multiple agencies that have funded the development of these standards. Okay, the types of students served by TIPSIDs, when I say that, I'm talking about adults or um, individuals in that 18 to 20 year, 21 year old age group. There were 27 funded across 23 states. Five of them serve adults only. Another five serve only students in that 18 to 21 year old age group that are still served by their school district. They're in dual, dual enrollment or concurrent enrollment programs. But legally they are still responsible, their school district is still responsible for them under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. 17 of the tips that serve both students who are duly enrolled and adults. Fortunately, we were able to have pilot data from the first year of funding, which was the uh, 2010 to 11 fiscal year. 507 students were served by 20 TIPSIDs operating across 31 institutes of higher education, IHEs, that's the acronym for that. Of those, eight of the TIPSIDs were in a planning year, meaning they did not serve students. And when we projected the data out over the five years of this grant period, uh, 53 institutes of higher education will be serving over 6,000 students. That's pretty powerful. And 
And before I go into the more difficult area of describing what we've come up with, um, I'd like to lay a foundation. The Commissioner of the Administration on Developmental Disabilities uh, addressed the project directors for the first year of the TIPSID annual meeting. And this is an excerpt from her comments. And it really lays a philosophical foundation for the standards. College is a time of all kinds of learning for young people. It is not just about the academics. But students with college with intellectual disabilities don't need college classes to teach them how to do laundry. Ask any parent of a 20-year-old, and they will tell you about the universality of laundry problems. <laughs> they have to figure out how to do it in the laundromat, just like everyone else. Students with intellectual disabilities don't need special classes to teach them how to keep their apartments clean. Really? Have you been in a dorm lately? They need to learn those life skills through real experience in the same way that all students do. Students with intellectual disabilities don't need to be doing second grade math that the K-12 system worked on unsuccessfully for 12 years in an institution of higher education. They need to be learning how to manage money, budget their resources, open a checking account, and handle their finances, just as all college students do. Students with intellectual disabilities don't need to experience additional discrimination to be told that they are different or unwelcome, as recently happened with a young woman with Down syndrome in Southern Oregon as she was kicked out of a ceramics class that she was auditing. Students with intellectual disabilities don't need to be learning how to take notes with paper and pens in special classes on study skills. They need to learn how to use technology <laughs> to access the concepts being presented in college courses just as other college students are learning to do. Students with intellectual disabilities on college campuses don't need to be participating in outdated pre-vocational service models where function and placement drive the activities as opposed to person-centered planning, choice, self-determination, and ed educational need. And students with intellectual disabilities certainly do not need special safety rules that diminish their independence as young adults. They need to be able to live and learn take risks, and make mistakes on college campuses, including big mistakes, as all college students do. It would be a travesty for this initiative, this terrific opportunity we've worked so hard to create to become another separate, segregated special program where young adults with disabilities are treated as subjects and beneficiaries instead of affording them the respect and the, they deserve as self-determined college students. Actually, for those of you who don't know, Sharon is um, one of the key stakeholders who's responsible for the passage of the Higher Education Opportunities Act. She has made a life commitment to seeing this grow nationally, and she has funded Think College and um, has been, if we ask her to present, she's always said yes. So know that having her, she used to be a staffer for um, Miller in, in California. And um, she and Madeline Will and uh, Stephanie Lee really, really made the difference in getting this law passed. So uh, hear her commitment, but also hear her message. Okay, why have standards-based framework? One, we wanted to make sure it was reflective of higher education and not of K-12 because we are functioning in a, a, a different world with different language. And we really wanted to look at a communication structure, a common language. We don't have that. Up until this point, there has been no guidance on program development. People have functioned in a vacuum for the most part. I mean, with the internet, people can do some research, but there's been really no formal types of guidance. So this is the first time that our field has really come forth with um, guidance as, as such as standards, quality indicators, and benchmarks. Okay, the other key thing is looking at a structure for organizing and analyzing the data across common data points. Our field has never had that before. 
what saved the TIPSID program this, this particular year is when Senator Harkin's staffers called us and said, do you have any data? And we were able to give them up more than the data you just saw, which spoke volumes. When they saw 6,000 students served by this program, it, it made an impact. So we're, we, our funding was continued. I don't, we don't know about the future, but we're certainly going to try. But having standards, quality indicators, and benchmarks are a key start to really beginning to um, amass evidence of what practices are working and those that are not. And looking at different program characteristics in relationship to improved um, student outcomes. Okay, how do we develop these things? Did, did Deborah Hart just sit in front of her computer and go, well, I think we should have this or that? Well, I wish I could have done that because it certainly would have been more efficient and a heck of a lot easier. We actually embarked upon, it took over three years, and we used a Delphi process, which is iterative and designed for um, new areas of study. We modeled it on the uh, head, the Association of Higher Education and Disabilities, the Delphi process they used to develop standards and quality indicators for disability services that are on ca college campuses across our country with the advent of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And uh, Stan Shaw and Lyman Dukes were the people who developed those standards, really were very collegial and um, gave us a lot of their time and guidance so we didn't uh, replicate a lot of the lessons learned that they went through. It was a three-part process. We selected individuals, I think there were over 35 individuals who participated in this process. And our criteria for those individuals were people who had been in the field of post-secondary ed for students with intellectual disabilities for at least two years or greater. We had parents, advocates, faculty, disability service people, program coordinators, directors, whatever title, but they had to have had two years direct experience. And I can tell you, they, <clears throat> they represented the full range of the different types of post-secondary programs that we have knowledge on across the country. They were programs that had been existed, in existence for years and offered um, separate curriculum to those that were based much more on an individual support model. Um, and the curriculum are, is the college course catalog. So from one extreme to the other and a whole host of folks in between. We really wanted it truly representative. So the um, process really took, when we actually got to having re the expert review panels, that was uh, approximately about a year. But prior to that, different groups of ex experts helped us develop at least a draft of those. Now the purpose is, one is as a self-assessment tool. The self-assessment tool hopefully eventually will be interactive and it's meant as a, a, a self-reflection. Nobody's really seeing these. It's meant for a program looking at enhancing existing services or those developing a new program. So it's a self-assessment tool, but we're hoping eventually it will be relational and we have other databases on the Think College website. There's a literature database and uh, training and TA materials that we've been collect collecting information from folks like yourselves across the country so that people don't have to reinvent the wheel. They can make it a better wheel. That's the idea anyway. So this self-assessment tool will eventually, as you rate yourself, if there are areas that have greater need, it will go through our databases and generate a report. So it will give you more information on other areas or um, training and TA materials that might help you out. It's also meant to, I, I can't tell you how many families and students I get contacted by and have over the past five years, and it just increases every time there's a US News and World Report or something like that. My email box is 
over the limit instantly. My son or daughter has an intellectual disability or is on the autism spectrum, and they want to go to college. And my first response is, that's great. Where do you live? Where, or where do they want to go to college? And nine times out of 10, there is probably no post-secondary opportunity in their local neighborhood or state. So we've got a lot of, we've come a long way, but we've got a long way to go. But what I do give families is um, these standards, quality indicators, and benchmarks to really re help them as they shop around looking for different post-secondary college programs. Lastly, it's really a foundation for the evaluation system we're using for the National Coordination Center, along with a lot of the other GEPRA requirements. Overall, there are eight standards, 18 quality indicators, and 87 benchmarks that were identified. Are we 100% all the way there? Most likely not. This is a start. Remember, we've never had anything like this in the field before. So th this is a, a, a real, uh, I'd like to think, progressive uh, beginning to getting a little more formalized with how we're looking at post-secondary education for, for students with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Okay, now hang in with me for just a little bit. I'm gonna try to explain how we conceptualized this framework. You see the four rounded square boxes there. They represent academic access, career development and competitive employment, self-determination, and campus membership. Those we view as the cornerstones of practice. What do we mean by academic access? I have some notes here because I'm too old to remember these things now. Um, academic access looks at really beginning with person-centered planning, and you heard other speakers identify that as a common practice. I think, Bob, you mentioned it's been around, or you thought it was around for a good 20 years at least. There's m many different kinds. There's PATH, there's McGill action planning maps, whole life planning, on and on and on. The common theme is that the student, for the first time, unlike an individualized education plan, is at the center of this person-centered plan, and they are empowered to begin looking at setting goals for their life. Now, most students, you know, at age, say you start this early at age 14, through 16, probably their first response is, well, what do you like? What do you want? I don't know, <laughs> right? But all the more reason to really actually being more formal about talking with young people, whether they have a disability or not. It becomes more critical if they do have a disability, in particular an intellectual disability. Okay, so it begins with person-centered planning helping the student, empowering the student to begin to articulate some of those goals and career interests. And then it goes to sitting with an academic advisor to help the student in identifying courses that relate to that career goal and other personal areas of interest. So academic advising. And this is aligned with the tenets of the Higher Ed Opportunities Act. And actually, I think they use the same words. It's a little scary. Um, students are taking typical college courses for credit, non-credit courses, audit, continuing ed. There's a whole range of ways that students are accessing inclusive academic options. Um, they often have, the Institute of Higher Education has often waived placement tests Accuplacer community college folks, you know, the Compass Accuplacer, those have been waived. And prerequisites, for the most part, have been waived. Are we seeing students going into advanced physics courses and calculus? For the most part, no, but there have been some students who actually did take courses like that and they did exceptionally well. But for the most part, most students aren't taking those advanced type of courses. 
but they could if they wanted to. The choice is there. Um, disability service is also a key player in creating access. Most disability service folks have not jumped on board with supporting students with intellectual disabilities. Why, why do you think that is? Because it's hard. It's hard? <laughs> Resources. And Laura, you're good. You're good. But I like that. And not a lot of people with these disabilities wanting to go to college right now. Demand, demand not high enough? Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's a good one. For the most part, I'm sorry, who did I miss? Also, not enough political power on the part of people that struggle with them. Not enough political power, yeah. For the most part, what we hear, because we uh, present at a head every year, I can tell you five years ago there were three people in the room, and last year it was standing room only. So it's, we're making some inroads. But what we hear when we listen to disability services, and I'm painting with a broad brush, there's they, a number of folks really, who are in those roles um, are the key supporters of, of individuals with intellectual disabilities going to college. But overall, there still is resistance. And the number one reason was resources. They often are a disability service person of one. They are it. And they serve several hundred students. So in fairness, I mean, that kind of makes sense in some ways. So what we often talk about is, well, if students with intellectual disabilities are going to be participating in academic courses, they're going to need traditional accommodations that disability services provide, and they know how to. For example, uh, note takers, just as one example. But that person also brings additional resources with them. A lot of programs are establishing educational coaches, uh, peer navigators, I, I mean, all, a whole range of for pay professionals to student volunteers. So they're actually bringing additional resources that would benefit a whole host of other students. So when that, that partnership, you heard Bob and other folks talking about a collaborative partnership, when you approach disability services in that spirit, they're usually much more receptive. And even if they're not at the beginning, when they start to see these additional supports in uh, actual college classes, they often change their minds. So I share that with you. The last thing I want to say about academic access, and it's probably our number one area of training and technical assistance, is around universal design for learning. It's really, and we don't approach it on this is for students with intellectual disability or who have autism or fill in the blank. This is for every student in your class. It's a way of teaching a broader range of students with different learning styles and to accommodate them. And we had a research project recently in Massachusetts that actually it was a quasi-experimental design, if any of you care about that kind of stuff. Um, I didn't, actually don't. but. Um, I've been told it's kind of more rigorous. And student, we surveyed the students who were in these developmental classes where their um, instructors were trained on universal design strategies. And what we found was they were getting out of these classes that normally they weren't passing. And they were completing the, the two -year, uh, their two-year degree and they were going on to four-year school. And the numbers were statistically significant. So universal design for learning is a major, major area. And it's for all students, not just students with intellectual disabilities. What we've seen is a lot of the TIPSIDs really have moved. Those who were in existence, I'll, I'll use two that I recently had the great opportunity to visit, have really moved more toward course access. Uh, Taft College, the TIPSID students are taking Taft courses now. Um, Highline Community College in the Seattle area has really looked at restructuring some of their other separate curriculum to look at the um, 
regular typical college courses also. There are new programs that have just started that are using the standards and the academic access uh, benchmarks to look at creating uh, more inclusive options from the very beginning. The next one, career development. I don't know that you could beat what Taft has, has managed to do. We were very, very impressed uh, in, in the employment, competitive employment area. You clearly have established business partners. I mean, you are a small community, but man, you guys are really known in the business community from Frito-Lay to individual dentists and um, have some wonderful, compelling stories in, in student outcomes and, and really, in many ways, are a model for what other programs could do. Um, career development, again, what do we start with? You've heard it all morning, person-centered planning. Again, empowering the student to begin to look at what types of um, areas that they would be interested in. And it's okay to start out doing cosmetology, as, as Bob pointed out. And it's almost as important as finding something you like to find out what you don't like. So there's real value in that. Um, my colleague, Meg Griegel, for those of you who may know her, one of the, she was doing a study in Connecticut and Maryland, and one of the things she found that really created more employment, competitive employment outcomes, was that there was someone in their program that focused, or in the Institute of Higher Ed, that focused on job developing, development. When you think about it, it, makes, it just makes common sense. But we've seen a lot of different programs across the country where they don't have anyone whose job it is to do that. And as a result, we're not seeing em employment outcomes in the manner we would like to see. So I think that that's important. Um, let me go on to campus membership. By that we mean really de assisting the student using natural supports whenever possible or peer navigators or whatever you want to call this peer group um, to really help students to be get, become connected to the college community. If there's sororities and fraternities, can they participate? They may choose not to, that's cool too, but can they? Sporting events, all those type of rich opportunities where students really begin to socialize, learn self-determination skills, and uh, some of the soft skills that they will need to be successful as adults and in employment settings. Last but not least is self-determination skills, and we've seen and we have no data on this yet, but I'm very interested in looking at teaching self-determination skills in um, a separate curriculum and in the isolation versus teaching those skills where they're naturally going to occur, whether it's on campus, in the workplace, because students with intellectual disabilities often have a hard time generalizing. So what they may learn to do in one environment may not be what they can replicate elsewhere. So we don't have the answer to that yet, but I pose that as a question to you all. Okay, those four standards of practice and the associated quality indicators and benchmark are essential elements of quality practice. You still with me? Okay, the other four standards our programmatic infrastructure. Those are alignment with the college, existing college systems and practices. Coordination and collaboration. Sustainability and ongoing evaluation. Alignment with college systems and practices. What is admissions, registration, orientation? Don't recreate that if it already exists on your campus. Enhance it. It's already there, so the chances of sustainability are, are significantly increased. Also looking at the, the governance structure of your Institute of Higher Education and participating in that, whether it's faculty senate, 
So you're looking at as a contributing member of the Institute of Higher Ed versus as someone who's just an outsider doing something separate. Again, makes it very hard to sustain things if you're, you're really separate from the, the college. Now, you've heard a lot about coordination and collaboration, and I really want to make a pitch for that, because the keys here are within the um, Institute of Higher Ed setting and externally. You heard Bob refer to teaming. All the programs in Massachusetts, anyway, uh, have a local support team, and they meet sometimes on a monthly basis and sometimes quarterly. It's up to them. And they represent all the external funding streams from voc rehab to labor to one-stop career centers to providers to community-based minority organizations, depending on the community, the DD agency, voc on and on and on, fill in the blank. And there are students and families on that. And they're taking ownership of this initiative to keep it going and to grow it when, when appropriate. The third one, sustainability, I've already talked to. Because if you have alignment, okay, that, this is now technology telling me I've done. Um, but, but I'm not. <laughs> and I get to push the OK key and override it, so. Um, Sustainability is key, and you need to think about this from the very beginning and look at uh, the Higher Education Opportunities Act allows for federal financial aid. You really, that's one option. Um, the National Corporation for Community Service has an Eagles, the Eagle Siegel Education Award. Boy, I thought I had trouble with Tipsit. Um, <laughs> That gives a student, at least it's, it's aligned with what the Pell Grant is. Students can get $5,000 plus dollars if they're serving in um, service learning or AmeriCorps programs. And if they go to an institute of higher education that is, that is part of the corporation, they'll match it. So the student could have $10,000 conceivably. It's grossly, grossly underutilized. Sure, get me to try to say it again. You guys are mean now. Um, it's an education, the Siegel Education Award. And shoot me an email and I promise I will send you a URL link to more information on that, probably more than you'll want to see. But it is really, really underutilized. And how empowering is it that it's the student's own money? The key here is looking at doing more blended or braided resources and funding options so you don't have your all your eggs in one basket so to speak because especially in these economic times who knows when that stream's going to dry up um, last pitch here on ongoing evaluation it's critical to be collecting data and again I'd like to applaud my colleague from Taft colleagues from Taft College because I know they've been collecting outcome data for a number of how many years Jeff 17. It's hard to take something away when you have the data to show how effective it is and how well something's working. But if you don't have that information, it's very easy to sunset a program. So it's critical. It also allows you, from an internal perspective, to correct things that aren't working as well. There's nothing wrong with that or to change over time. What you thought was really good pra practice five years ago may not be so good right now. So I think it's important both to have internal evaluation and to also when you can purchase it, an external evaluator to give a, a real independent look-see at your, your different initiatives. So there you have the conceptual framework for the standards, quality indicators, and benchmarks. They represent much more of a comprehensive, hopefully cohesive network, uh, framework that you really wouldn't look at one over another. They're of equal importance. They support the Higher Ed Opportunities Act. 
And they, w what we're hoping for is that they simultaneously allow for individualized surfaces. So it's not just, here's the program, here's what we offer, you get it, whether you need it or not, and if you have other needs, well, we're sorry. So there, there is some flexibility built in. Are we all the way there? We're just beginning. This is a first start at getting a new field, a new area uh, of uh, guidance structure that will change over time. We're just beginning to look at validating these now. So. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with a promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, Fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.